Okay, everyone. Once again, good morning and welcome to another session on DevOps. So today we'll be seeing another basic topic that is on networking. So once again, we will not be going full in depth, but uh, we'll be sharing sufficient knowledge that will get you onboarded. So networking is again a very big topic and a dedicated field. It also has subtopics that people specialize on. So covering the entire networking stack is nearly impossible for one person. So there is a lot of thing into networking and we will try to cover the basics that is uh, needed for us to know on a day to day basis. So getting started with networking, the first thing we will always refer is the ISO OSI layer. This is the definition or the standard defined by the ISO and internationally accepted. So this again, we have, at least for me, I've studied last was in my college days. So when I was doing my engineering, so you also must have come across this during your education. The most basic thing whenever it is thought is your ISO SI layer. This is generally not referred to when you're working towards or when you're working. But having a knowledge of this is very important. This is generally referenced whenever you're working on any networking tool or any networking activity. So you may have heard the term, the term uh, layer one switch, layer two switch, layer three router, something like that. So this generally refers to the ISO SI layer. This sets the standards for setting up a network device. It could be anything. It could be from your network card on your laptop, your Wi-Fi adapter on your laptop to a big enterprise switch. So anything that you say with regards to network, it would always be governed by the ISO SI layer. This is the most widely accepted standard. Yes, there are other standards as well but this is more widely accepted and utilized in the industry. <laughs> so the seven layers, we just need to know what the layers are meant for. The first one is your physical layer. This is the layer responsible for actually transmitting the data over a physical medium. Then you have the data link layer. This defines what format the data would go on the network the network layer to decide which physical path the data will take. The transport layer, this transmits data using transmission protocols, including TCP and UDP, the session layer. This maintains the connection and is responsible for controlling ports and sessions. Presentation layer ensures that the data is usable, is in a usable format and where the data encryption occurs. And lastly is the application layer. This is where a uh, human interaction takes place with the data. So this is mainly will be your application that can access the network services. So in simple words, this is how you break your ISO SI layer. So you have the software layers. The first three layers on top are the software layers and will vary depending upon the operating system that you utilize. Then you have the transport layer. So that's the one that converts, that stays between your hardware and software layer. And the hardware layer, so this is completely managed by the hardware on your device. So again, this could be your Wi-Fi adapter, it could be your Ethernet adapter. Or it could be a device such as your firewall, your Wi-Fi adapter, your Wi-Fi router at home, or a switch, anything that would be your last three layers. Now, the most common type of switches that you get is your physical layer switch. That is your layer one switch. Now, how the cost is distributed when it comes to networking devices, the more higher you are on your OSI layer, that much more expensive your network device becomes. Now, when I say a network device, I mean the devices that are responsible for routing of traffic. Let it be your firewall, 
let it be your Wi-Fi router, let it be your switch, which is there at home. Switches are generally not used at home because you do get Wi-Fi routers with sufficient number of ports. And nowadays, most devices are Wi-Fi enabled. So you do not make use of switches these days. But yes, they are being used in companies. Now, again, the layer one switch. So they are, again, mainly not made in use because they do not have traffic inspection so the layer one switch is the cheapest and most easiest to configure all it does is that it routes your packets and doesn't do any sort of inspection so as you go up on the iso si model so that much more expensive your switches and routers become you must have seen when you go to buy a new router some routers are very cheap some routers are expensive. Why? Because that depends upon which layer of the OSI ISO model it uh, sits on. Most of the cheap routers would be up to your layer three switch, that is your network layer. They generally do not go into your transport session and the above layers. Most common ones would just be up to your layer two. So you even wouldn't have layer three for the home devices. Very rarely you have layer three devices for home purposes. Now, again, it differs according to what purpose you buy it for. And what all things you configure on it. Now, before we go ahead, so we will also discuss the IPv4. So this again uses the ISO, ISO, the ISO OSI standard. This now comes at the lowest level, that is your level one, where you determine and uh, sorry, it comes at your network layer. So, uh, yeah, it's one more layer up, sorry, that's your transport layer. It decides where your data has to go. Then your network layer takes the responsibility of sending the data. Another thing that uh, was considered as a standard couple of years back that was your hardware address that is the hardware address of your ethernet device so it was considered to be unique around the world however since the emergence of virtualization we are also seeing a lot of virtualized network devices so that has induced a host or you can say a flood of networking devices now available. And generally these hardware addresses do overlap. So no longer we call these hardware addresses unique. Now, what are these hardware addresses? This is like your phone IMEI. So these are unique to every socket. These are unique to every ethernet card. These are again unique to every WAN adapter. So on my machine itself, I can just do open my CMD and just do an IP config. I'll do a slash all. So you can see over here, this gives me the breakup of all the connections that are available on the machine. I'll just take one. So I will see for the Ethernet adapter. Okay, so this is my Wi-Fi Ethernet adapter that's currently active. First of all, you can see over here, it has a physical address. This physical address is the MAC address for this machine. So this was considered to be unique throughout the world. However, now because of the virtualization, so there is possibilities of duplication. Also, you can set your own defined mac address so most networking devices most many os's as well and your wi-fi routers routers enterprise devices also let you configure a custom mac address so you are not bounded by the physical address that is set you can change the physical address this physical address is used for DHCP assignment. So this is something that we will see later on. Next, the next block that you can see over here is your IPv4 address. Sorry, before that, 
it says dhcp enabled so we will see that in shortly it's auto configured so it says yes it's automatically configured then we have the local ipv6 address so this is your address that is recognizable over the internet it's a quite a big address yes not humanly readable so we do not need to know this address the machine will take care of resolving the address to send the data and get back the data so the router and everything that's why when we discuss the osi layer we see the lower three parts are generally we do not we are not concerned with it as end users so we generally do not see any of the part we rather do not see any of the seven layers we are only concerned with the application and the data that is visible on it but in the back end this is what it uses to connect ipv6 is a new standard but when i say new it's not that it's come last year it has been around since a very long time i think more than uh, 10 to 15 years i'm not sure the exact timeline yes but it has been around quite a long time it has not been widely adapted yet why because the devices and all need to be compliant with ipv6 currently uh, most of the devices available configured on the internet i are ipv6 compatible however the adoption rate is still very low ipv4 is the most commonly used protocol ipv4 as you see over here is a more readable ip address so whenever you connect to your admin you connect to the it folks they generally ask you what is your ip address so that they can connect remotely so this is one of the ip addresses they take likely in your project if you need to connect to a server or you need to connect to a resource they would give you a url or an IP address that would be in this format. Using this IP address, you can connect to the unique machine that is specified. Now, once again, this IP address that you see over here is defined of four octets. So these are binary octets. So because of that, you can have 32 bits of address that comes to a total of couple of billions of addresses that you can create from those addresses as well you can have a couple of ranges but couple actually many ranges are already reserved as private ip addresses for home networking you will generally see 190 to 168 octets for enterprises you would generally see 10 dot octets what these octets mean? So these are the private IP addresses. Public IP addresses are also available. So that is used by your ISP to route data to your router. Likewise, when you connect to a website, say google.com or say yahoo.com, any website that you connect to, that will again have an IP4 address that you would connect to. So for example, now if I do a ping to google.com, now what I see over here may be a bit different for you. Why? Because Google uses global DNS. So we will discuss on that again. So you will get the Google server, which is most closest to you, and you will get that IP address you will see reflecting. So this server IP address, that is 142.240.77.46, this is the IP address of google.com for me. When you may do this thing, you may get a different IP address. So that depends on your location and the best route that is available to reach that particular location. Likewise, when you come back or you see something known as a subnet mask, this defines how many hosts you can have in that particular network this comes to our next slide uh sandeep uh, pravin here yes yeah i have a small doubt so mm -hmm. uh, like uh, you 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 said that you know a uh, physical address that can be custom right 
Correct. I mean, we we can set as custom physical address. So what Correct. if you know, if we hmm. set any uh, custom address and you know that is also associated with any other physical address. Mm-hmm. So will there be any be conflict or any uh, you know other uh, or any other uh, you know uh, IPv4 address or any other address uh, would be taken care? Of? Yeah, see, that's a good question. Now it would be a conflict if that physical address is duplicated within the same network and and okay and you have dhcp enabled so what is dhcp first let me introduce that dhcp is a protocol that gives you dynamic ip addresses so when you have dhcp enabled on your network it will read your mac address your the machine address and if you have that duplicated, then two of the machines will receive the same address, the same IPv4 address or IPv6 address. So your router or your switch would get confused to whom the data should go. So that would, if your switch is intelligent enough, it would give you a warning and it would block both the hosts from coming onto the network because it's a duplicate IP address on the network. So both the hosts would be barred from the network. Also, the operating system would recognize that there's a duplicate IP on the network and it would not get onto the network till the till the conflict is resolved. However, now if you configure, if suppose you have a single MAC address and your friend also configures a MAC address, but that will be in his, his own network that is completely disjoint from you, then their DHCP server will give them a different address. And since it's a disjoint network, so there would be no conflict. Both would have different uh, IP addresses assigned to them. So there would be no conflict between the two. So having the same MAC address would not make any difference if the network in which they are hosted is completely different because then they would use their IP address to connect to each other. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the note. Welcome. So it does happen. So that's why I told now since we the virtualization has come out and the virtualization MAC addresses are supposed to be within a particular range. So it's very common that two machines, two or maybe more machines would get the same MAC address assigned. However, it is your IP address that is finally assigned to it and the and you will never get the same MAC addresses. So they are millions and billions of mac addresses that could be configured so there is no way that within a same host that is within the same network you would have two mac addresses two same mac addresses configured definitely you can go and define it by yourself so that would be a manual error however the system would ensure that within its location it would never assign an identical mac address that is already present within the network. So there are several ways to do that. So yeah, that's another big topic, how it can ensure that IP addresses are not in use, IP addresses are free, the MAC addresses are not present within the network. That's again a very huge topic. So we are not covering that, but yes, there are mechanisms already in place that take care of this. So next we are coming is this to the CIDR notation. Now again, this is for IPv6 that shows how many hosts can be configured in a particular network. Now, again, coming back to my command prompt. So when I see over here, I have a subnet marks of 255.255.255.0. The last zero means that it is open for configuration. So I can have 255 hosts configured within this network. So I can go from zero to 255. Zero and 255 are sorry it will be 0 to 255 so 254 uh, sorry correct just 255 so 0 and 255 are blocked they are called the broadcast addresses so every the first and last address in a subnet are always reserved you cannot utilize them for any other purpose they are just used for broadcasting so when I say to, when I look at my host list over here, when I say four addresses I have, so you see, I do not have two and one because those addresses, those subnets are not routable. 
So when I say 30, I have four addresses. Four addresses means the first and the last one are reserved. Then I have only two usable IP addresses. Likewise, when I go slash 29, so this gives me eight addresses. So I can you actually utilize just six. Then as I go on increasing the octet, I have 16, 32, 64. Always I'll do a minus two so that I have that many number of hosts that I can configure within a network. Now, when I say a subnet, what is a subnet? A subnet is a pool of IP addresses that you can use within a given networking location. So again, coming back to my command prompt. So the IP addresses that you see over here, I have 192.168.1.58. So this is a pool of IP addresses that I can use within my network, within my host. It will be different for different places. So this is my home network. So that's why you see I have this particular IP address range. The most commonly that is used in home routers is 192.168.1 and then you have xx so generally your last octet is shown as xs to show that that is the ip address that's available then you have 192.168.0 again dot xx so these are the two common home networking ip addresses that are configured they will mostly be between these two but this does not limit you from reconfiguring it to something else. So it's up to your requirement. You can definitely log into your home router and change the IP subnet range that it leases. The subnet marks is again be this common one, 255.255. Sorry. Dot 255.255 and dot zero. This will again be the most common subnet mask. Now you may say, I just have two or four devices at home. Why do I need 255 addresses? Why do I need to configure 256 addresses in my host? So this starts from zero. So you have 256 addresses that I can lease. So this is a common standard. You can definitely go and reduce this. So if I put a 128, that cuts down the IP addresses to half. Likewise, I can keep on increasing this. So if I put a 242, so this gives me 16 IP addresses that I can make use of. So likewise, we can configure as much IP addresses we want to configure. So you are not restricted to the IP addresses, to the default configuration. You can definitely go and make the change but you leave it as the default because it does not have any overhead number one and in case tomorrow you want to add more devices it is convenient for you it is very unlikely that home routers would get more devices more than 10 devices typically connected to them so home routers are not configured to take much load it depends upon the type of router that you have configured it has a limit of number of machines that you can connect to it that is through the ethernet ports and also the wi-fi adapter so there's a limit of number of devices that can connect over the wi-fi as well so it's not unlimited so always remember there is a limit that the device can handle now this limit is determined by the hardware spec by the hard hardware specs a cheaper router could easily handle up to eight devices maybe above eight devices it would start getting issues issues such as restarts or you would see packet drop slowness so many things could come depending upon what all things you have configured high-end routers which have better chipsets they can handle much better data then come the enterprise devices so these are generally so the question mostly comes why are enterprises devices so expensive whereas our home devices you can just get in around two to three thousand you can do your full routing vpn everything you can do in a cheap device why do enterprises have to pay so much because of the number of devices that it can support home routers are not capable of doing that the 
enterprise devices can handle a huge number of hosts connected to them plus they give you a lot of benefits of the osi iso model so depending upon what layer switch or router that is purchased it can do perform those capabilities hence the cost as well that is associated with it so even when i was starting my career it was always a question that at home i have a 900 rupees router and everything works fine whereas in my office they don't have a router less than 2 to 3 lakhs so it is that expensive but that has the capability of handling so many loads it does do a lot of traffic inspection routing blocking so even in our office devices even when you are connected to vpn on your machines you would see you cannot browse many sites and all they are blocked so this is your layer 7 router or you can say a layer 7 particularly firewall that does the blocking so this can do full traffic inspection it can also inspect https traffic so that is supposed to be very secure. So that is another type of inspection it can do. Hence, also the cost would increase. So like we discussed, the higher you go onto your OSI ISO layer, that much your cost will increase. So just a brief on IPv6. So what we saw on the IPv4, so that was just octets of bits, whereas when we come to IPv6, you see we have 16 bits per octet or per uh, slab. And it's a much bigger IP range. Now, there's a limitation on the IP addresses that we have. So when it comes to IP4, we can have 4.3 billion IP addresses. And the world population is more than that, much more than that close to around 8 to 10 billion. So we are already out of IP ranges. Then the question comes that why is it not yet saturated? Because not every person requires a publicly addressable IP address. The most common IP addresses that we would get is a private address. Any ISP that you would take your internet connection from, they would most probably give you an private IP address, they will never give you a public IP address configured to your router. Some ISPs do give that, but majority of them would give you a private IP address. Hence, just having one public IP address at their gateway, they could configure millions of IP addresses, that is private IP addresses on their backend network. So that's the reason one ISP can cater to again millions of people on the same IPv4 addresses. Likewise, your phone IP address, your phone devices, etc. They also make use of private IP addresses. So again, there there is no public IP address defined or configured for those devices. Hence, you can see that we have a lot of devices configured. So we have a limited range of IPv4 addresses. Again, the private IP addresses are repeatable. So this IP address range that we discussed, this would be common across all Wi-Fi routers. Majority of the Wi-Fi routers, routers that you would buy, they will have this IP address range configured. Then why do not we have a conflict? This is something known as natting. So this is the word NAT. This is your network address translation. What this does is that this will convert your private IP address and encapsulate it behind a public IP address. A public IP address is an IP address that you can access from the internet. So like we saw for the example, google.com has a public IP address that is 142.240.77.46. I have is a private IP address assigned to my machine that is 192.168.1.58. So what are the list of private IP addresses that can be utilized? What are the list of public IP addresses that are reserved and you cannot use it on your own? You need to purchase public IP addresses from an ISP. If you configure it also on your device, 
you're not going to get any traffic getting routed to it why because the router needs to know that this public ip address is specified over here that is what the isp does on their end when they need to give a public ip address to an client so that is how so that's a big process again so you'll not go into depth but yes it's you can definitely define it on your router you can also assign a public ip address on your machine so nobody is going to stop you from doing that but it will not be accessible from the internet just because of the fact that the isp has not provisioned it so until the isp provisions it and says okay that this ip address is configured for your machine you will not be able to use that public ip address likewise even in my network i have configured my ip address as 1.58 so this has come via dhcp however if i configure this something else if i put it as 0.150 0.58 so will it work no it will not work because it is not in the subnet range though i'm free to get it configured it is not going to stop me from assigning that ip address but it will not be routable because my wi-fi router does not know this ip address range and hence no traffic will be routed though i assign the specific ip address to it so ip addresses always need to be in the range that they are supposed to be working in so you need to be very careful of that if you have a subnet defined you need to select an ip address within that subnet mostly the ranges are set dynamically so it's a dhcp range so always remember you will mostly not need to configure an ip address who configure static ip addresses isps then servers that are hosted on the internet if you have certain project requirements where you require the ip to be static so there is the place where you will set ip addresses as static so it doesn't mean that no one, nobody does set ip address as static people do set it and yes it is a requirement at most places static ip addresses are more commonly used for servers whereas dynamic ip addresses are most commonly used for end users i come to the next topic so we will discuss about protocols now what are protocols you must have heard of tcp ip then http etc so these are protocols internet protocols this is how machines talk to each other so when a machine needs to connect to another machine they need to speak in the same language so it's the same thing like when we talk to each other we will always pick out a common language we have many mother tongues we have our own languages own set of languages the own our own way of speaking likewise when we communicate to each other we need to come to a common ground now in india we will mostly especially in the office will mostly speak in english if we go outside depending upon which state you would speak and hindi or you would speak a regional language so that would be your protocol for that particular place whereas when you come to office you will generally try to speak in english for most of the official communication but when you speak to a colleague who you know knows an other more convenient local language so you will generally converse on that local language so that is your protocol between the two of you though you may start in english then you will switch back to the default language why because that is more convenient for you likewise in networking also you have defined protocols how machines communicate with each other the most common protocol you will be aware of is your http protocol so that's a variant of the tcp ip protocol now these all are derivatives of the tcp sorry of the osi iso stack so they omit certain layers they take some more consideration in and they create a layer out of it so more details can be searched later on on the internet how these protocols work so likewise you have protocols such as tcp udp icmp yeah these are some networking terms that are used 
So these are the most common protocols that are used. ICMP is basically your ping protocol. So whenever you do a ping to a machine, like I did to google.com, that's your ICMP ping. So it sends a small packet to the network adapter of the host, or you can say to the guest uh, where we have, a, that is a remote machine. And that machine will respond back to me with this packet saying that I've received it. So that is the ICMP protocol, most commonly used to check whether a machine is alive or not. Being depreciated quite recently, so all new modern operating systems by default disable this protocol just for the reason of DDoS attacks. So you must have heard DDoS attacks, that is distributed DOS denial of service attacks. So ping is one of the most common way to conduct a DDoS attack. So this is a very basic protocol just to check whether your machine is alive or not. It's available on the internet at all. Again, now this is handled at a much lower layer of your OSI ISO model. And it's handled at the network card itself. Any ping that will come in, a machine would generally respond back with the reply. You can ping any server on the internet. Most of them would reply back with a ping. When it comes but to modern security, especially to intranets and to servers that you have within your network, you would generally have ping disabled. It may be enabled to only VPN connections or internal network, but from external hosts, it will generally be disabled. Only the ports, that is your hosts that are required to be connected to, those would be available. So that brings us to the next topic now, that's a socket. What's a socket? A socket is basically your connection to a particular host using a particular protocol. A socket is a co combination of your IP address and the port to connect to a particular service. Now, what type of common ports do you see on the internet? The most common port is your, H your port 80. That's the HTTP port. So this is what you will be mostly connecting to. Now the mostly connected port is 443. That's your HTTPS port. Port 80 connections are mostly being depreciated. So no one is currently, people are being encouraged to move out of port 80 and use only HTTPS connections. So most of the websites now you would access on the internet by default would redirect to an HTTPS connection. It would, you would rarely see HTTP sites. They are, so it's not that it's completely removed, but most of the ports that you will see on the internet are HTTP. Most of your connections or the browser connections are HTTPS. That is your secured HTTP connections. So this is again a huge topic, how the HTTP works, how TCP IP works. Then you have the handshakes and all. So they are so again a huge topic. We are not going into that deep depth. We are just seeing an overview. So these are the most common protocols that we are using. Now, coming back to your NAT, how does your NAT work? So your NAT will take your protocol, will take your socket, and encapsulate it in the public IP address of your router and send that packet to the host, that is your remote machine that you're connecting to. Now, when you say your host, it will not directly go to your host. There will def definitely be several other devices in the middle. So we will now, for just for the sake of discussion, remove that out. It connects to the host. Your host will then process the request and send back the data. The data will come to the public interface of your router. Your router will pick that packet. It will decode it. In the decodation, it will also have your private IP address and your port number, that is your socket information. So it knows where the data needs to be sent back. Now this all activity, this all activity happens in couple of milliseconds. 
so you don't even know all this activity is happening in the background so that is the speed of it and it's not just one packet it does it for it does this for millions of packets in couple of seconds so that is in uh, milliseconds that was not in couple of seconds sorry in milliseconds it does so this is a very quick transaction it happens even before we can blink our eyes so that's the speed of it it's very fast and this is at your router so imagine what happens at an isp router so there there may be trillions of packet being processed per millisecond so that's why you require the more better enterprise grade switches and routers at their end so natting is a very common concept it's very widely used so this is how your private ip addresses can connect to the internet world and likewise your internet can connect to your private ip addresses now does it mean that from internet can someone access my machine that is behind my wi-fi adapter in my network no they cannot do that it can only be accessed via the request that you are sending out so no one can come inwards it's a one way traffic so you can send out a request the response comes in but if someone wants to connect to your machine directly that cannot be done so the reverse is not true you can definitely go outward that is from a natted ip address from a private ip address you can go external and you can come back internal using the same route but once the request is closed there is no further communication that can be done now again there are exceptions to this so you have a concept known as reverse natting and that is again very popularly used especially in the cloud where you have private ip addresses assigned to your various machines in order to put a machine that has a private ip address onto the internet you will do something known as a reverse nat so what we saw just now was a forward nat we do not call it forward nat the networking folks will most commonly use that word they will distinguish between the two but for most layman terms you will only call it a nat and you'll call this a reverse nat so when you say a reverse nat so this does the opposite it will convert a public ip address into an internal ip address so that is handled at your router level if it sees any traffic coming to a particular ip address to a particular socket yes you can define a port as well so if it sees a particular traffic coming to the ip and socket it will straight away route it to the private ip address socket that is defined on the router yes this needs to be defined on the router every wifi device every wifi or your firewall that you purchase on the market the cheapest one as well would have natting capabilities now does it mean that okay i have my wifi router i log in today i can do the nat no you cannot do that you need to have a public ip first configured on your router then only would you be able to do that if you have if your isp is giving you a private ip address then it's not going to work but if you have a public ip address assigned by your isp yes then it will work okay so this covers our huge topic of natting so once again i've just given you a very brief overview how things are working on the internet world so this is the way you can have thousands of internal i servers but have only one gateway through which those connections or your servers are exposed to the internet not all applications use the port 80 and 443 so there are other applications that make use of different ports many of the ports are reserved other ports you are free to define especially if you are uh, making a product no one stops you from utilizing these ports as well you can go ahead and use the port 80 and 443 but tomorrow if you plan to host a web server or let's say a website onto your machine or your server then if your application is also using the same port you will get a conflict hence it is recommended not to make use of these ports remember it's a recommendation it is not a hard and a fast rule that you should not make use of these ports 
it's a recommendation it's a suggestion given to you if you want you make use of the port if you have a business case you can definitely make use of the port for your custom service otherwise ideally you would not make use of these ports except for http and https request likely the other ports that are already reserved you would avoid making use of the ports for any of your custom requirements the next question that would come what are the reserve ports please google all the list or reserve ports are available on the internet you should avoid using them in your applications the ports which are they are huge number of ports so you can go up to 65536 ports i believe so that is the number of ports that you can utilize only the first uh, 1000 to 2000 ports are reserved by application unofficially up to 10000 ports one or another application has put a request okay we are making use of it so ideally any ports below 10000 you should not make use of it so that still leaves you leaves for you more than 55000 ports to utilize so make use of them and you can get many sockets out of them so hence you're not limited by the number of ports that you need to make use of and also your machine if you go to see makes lot of port socket requests so this is another useful command that you can run on your command that's netstat hyphen al or an this gives you a list of open ports that are on your machine so this is not just you can run it on your servers to find out what is blocking your port this is also on your machine you can see the list of ports that it gives me these all sockets are open to the internet for one or another reason i'm also not sure what these are doing all of these ports but you can see these are the in this is a local address and the foreign address my most of the foreign address are port 443 that is the https connections few 80 ports there are other ports as well that are active. I do not know what are those. I'm hoping it's configured by the IT team for some of their services. But yes, you can see there are so many sockets that are configured that are currently running on my machine. Likewise, on your machine, you may see a different list. You may see a different IP and port connection. Local port, you can see I'm seeing a number of 49,000 and higher that's configured so yes locally also you need a socket and this is your remote socket so this is how your networking is done that's a very high level overview you have your local socket and remote socket that you connect to and this is how your machines connect to remote machines to get data now this is again only your tcp ip protocol that is your http protocol https protocol Likewise, now TCP is called a connection oriented protocol. That is, it will give you a reliable connection to your machine. You will not lose any data when you use TCP IP. Whereas you have UDP that uses a connection less protocol. What happens in that, uh, so I'm not going into the full depth of it, so just giving you a gist. So there's a full depth of it, how it works, the handshake and all. So that's the TCP protocol. Whereas when you comes to UDP, it will only send the data. However, it does not care whether the data has successfully reached or not at the destination. It will continuously keep on sending the data. Even if any packet is missed, it may or may not send it. So this protocol is more suitable for voice communication, audio video communication, because you need reliable data and speedy data. If you get certain packets that come later on, you cannot present it because that packet is already late and you cannot present it to the, your, to the application. So it's already gone. So you don't care for the data that is left behind, but when it comes to TCP, suppose you are doing a banking transaction, you are trying to update a SQL Server database, or you are trying to push an image to a particular place. This all will be on TCP because losing even one byte, using even one zero in a transaction could have a huge impact. So that would always use TCP. That will send a confirmation that okay, this data has been received. And in case a data is, in case any data has been missed, 
it will request it to be retransmitted so that it can build the complete package it can build the complete data set that has been sent to it at its end so that's the main difference between the two protocols tcp and udp so these are the most widely used protocols on the internet within that tcp you have http so http you have seen these ports now how do i know what is tcp udp so you can see over here the protocol it says tcp most of the connections here are tcp your https connections also are tcp likewise your http connection also is tcp i don't know where it's connected to this also says the state it's established waiting now this is not a server machine this is my windows 10 machine on my local so same way you can also see on a server machine and then you see over you have the udp ports now again i do not know what the udp ports are being used for so i cannot answer that question but i'm hoping it's used for some good purpose on the machine and you see over here it does not say listening it does not say establish close wait nothing for the udp protocol why just for the same reason it's a connection less protocol when it gets the data it will process it it does not get the data it will not do anything so it will never going to show you a status it is connected open again you will never know whether a udp port is open or not whether a person is listening on the udp whether a socket is open on a udp port or not because it does not necessarily give you a confirmation that it has received a packet so that's why you will mostly see our most of the enterprise applications are built on your tcp protocol they are generally not built on udp udp like we discussed is good for streaming voice video those streamings it's very recommended for because it's a more real time protocol where you generally get less lag and yes you do not care if the packet is lost in the middle so you do not want an older packet frame to come onto your screen you would always want the latest frames or the latest audio to come onto your screen okay so we are almost out of time so i will open the dice for uh, any questions that you would have so we have another session at 2 30 at that time we will continue thank you so much sandeep for the session as of now Yeah, welcome. Uh, everyone, it's a request for the next session at 2.30. Please join by 2.25 so that we can start the session on time. And we do not have want like people waiting for others to join. Okay. I'll just stop the recording. So see you at 